Hello and welcome to Ag PhD Radio. It's Farmer Friday here in the Morton studio, and we'll be taking your calls and agronomic questions all throughout the show at 844-44-AG-PHD. You can also email us, radio at agphd.com. And my goodness, we got quite a few questions that have come in today. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, but we'll uh, we'll sure give a good run at it. Had a busy week. We had Neil Kinsey in town all week and just, just got done with a three-day seminar with him. That was very interesting, as always, eye-opening to a lot of things going on with fertility, even more so fertility, how it relates to the health of the livestock that are that are feeding on that forage or feeding on that grain and just all the way through the process. It's, it's a big deal to get soil fertility right. It is, but that's stuff we've talked about for quite a while. It, it's just a lot of times we feel there's a disconnect between the livestock, well, let's just say it this way, the livestock people and the crop people. So... The crop people are just focused on raising bushels. The livestock people are just focused on sourcing feed. And we got to somehow figure out a way to merge that together a little bit, little bit more. And quite frankly, we look at just overall even human health. We want more nutritious food for people. And that all comes back to soil fertility and soil health. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, just a little bit throughout the show today. But right now, let's get to the Ag PhD mailbag. It's the mailbag! All right, Brian, I had a question come in from Perry, and this is something that got discussed this week a little bit. Uh, Perry's question is, uh, when it comes to micronutrients, you talk about copper, and wondering, what do you think about copper helping seed coat quality in soybeans? What have you seen? Okay, so this goes back quite a few years on our own farm. We really boosted P and K levels, and we started getting a lot better yields and a lot bigger overall seed size. So there are a lot of things we do. So we raise seed beans, and there are many steps we take to try to get the best quality seed beans possible. Well, anyway, all that was great, except for the beans were literally busting out of the pods. Or I shouldn't say the pods, the shells, the, uh, the those seed coats. And it was just, it was too much. It was more than that bean could really handle. So Darren mentioned we were with Neil Kinsey all week. And this is one of the things we talked to Neil about a few years ago. And he goes, oh yeah, we have the same thing with grape growers. If everything else is great, except for the copper, then you don't have good seed coat resiliency. You need copper for seed coat resiliency. That's a real key. All right. Thanks for the question. Uh, get this one in from K.A. who says, I am an ordinary rice farmer and I've got a low pH problem. My rice plants look stunted, leaves turn yellow. Is giving it lime an instant solution or does it take time? The problem I have right now is I have the rice already planted and I can't really drain the water out due to heavy rainfall. So I'm wondering, can I spray a liquid calcium? over the plant for a temporary response well is is the problem the soil ph or is the problem the lack of calcium so what what's the real problem obviously we can't fix that soil ph is too late but you know to get more calcium into the plant can you do a little bit of foliar feeding with calcium of course you can i i mean you have to be a little bit careful with what you do but yeah, I mean, you're not going to be able to get anywhere near the full benefits because you weren't able to put the lime on in advance. So I would just say it's kind of what we often term the Band-Aid approach, and you do the best you can for this year, but then you just learn from it and you move forward, get the lime on going into next season. All right, got this in from Thomas, and he said, according to a Michigan State study, corn sequesters 36,000 pounds of carbon per acre, uh, an acre of grass draws down 920 pounds of carbon, but they're putting solar panels up on ground that used to raise corn. That looks like a net impact or a net loss of 35,000 pounds of carbon that we could have taken out of the atmosphere. Well, whoa, 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 though. That's a little bit misleading because there's a lot of that that ends up going back into the atmosphere again as the residue breaks down. But still, yes, um, a field of corn is obviously going to sequester an unbelievable amount more carbon dioxide than, and carbon than a field of solar panels. So, no, we agree. And, you know, it's kind of sad when you look at to make 
solar panels and to dispose of solar panels. Um, it's not real great for the environment. Not real great at all. Same thing with wind towers. Same thing with batteries. And here's the other thing. You know, everybody's talking about going electric. And that's great. Except for two things. Number one, we got to source a whole bunch of rare earth minerals. Where do you get those? China. Mm, at least right now. So that makes me really hesitant. We have some here in the United States, and I believe Canada does as well, but we got to get back to mining them. Once that happens, then fine. I'm, I'm all for producing all kinds of batteries. But, you know, on top of that, we got to look at, well, how are we going to generate all that electricity? And so that's where people want to talk about, you know, wind towers and solar panels and everything else. And again, you're, you're going to create some environmental issues just with the, the construction of those, the disposal of those. Because like wind towers, for example, they only last about 20 years. Solar panels, they can suffer all kinds of damage from things like hail. So I, I, I get it that people want to jump forward in certain directions, but... I mean, this is a slow thing. It's it's a 50-year process. And in the meantime, we do have biofuels that are fantastic for the environment. And we can, as farmers, sequester carbon. When you take a look at the, the whole carbon thing, what we can do to actually produce biofuels below zero on the carbon index scale, not above, not at, but below zero, is we just have to build soil organic matter. So basically, let's put it this way. Our crops are fantastic at pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. Our crops are also fantastic if we farm the ground correctly. And I'm not saying you have to do this, but I'm saying we can build soil organic matter. That means storing carbon down below the ground, which is what everybody's talking about. So whether you believe in this whole global warming thing or that we need to reduce carbon dioxide or not, let's face the facts here. People want to pay us as farmers to not only raise more crops and pull more carbon dioxide out of the air, but make our ground better by building soil organic matter. It's awesome. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. What do you think of when you hear Palmer amaranth or water hemp? If you use fierce herbicide in your soybean fields, you don't have to think about them at all. With two effective modes of action and up to eight weeks of residual control, Fierce takes on even the toughest weeds like water hemp and Palmer amaranth. Take control of your soybean fields and get incentives from Bayer Plus Rewards when you choose the power of Fierce herbicide. Talk to your local retailer today to put Fierce to work in your fields. Always read and follow label directions. During the Bronze Age, grain sorghum was a common crop in developing agriculture. Today's technology has changed virtually everything. But grain sorghum largely hasn't changed, until now. Introducing Emiflex herbicide, paired with iGrowth non-GMO herbicide-resistant grain sorghum. This duo controls foxtail and other tough weeds pre and post emergence, so you can grow like never before. Make history in your sorghum makers. Start today at sorghumpotential.com. Always read and follow label directions. Ag PhD has one mission, to give you the knowledge you need to make your farm more successful. That's why every issue of the Ag PhD Insider Magazine features crop fertility and pest management tips, insights into the world's highest yielding farmers, updates and results from our infield research trials, as well as the latest agronomy information from Brian and Darren Hefty. We put it all in one place so you can make your farm more productive and profitable. Subscribe to the Ag PhD Insider at agphdinsider.com. Weeds rob you of yield potential, so rob them of the chance to grow with powerful corn herbicide solutions from Corteva AgriScience. Weeds won't know what hit them, but you will. Because you can count on all the top corn herbicide products, including Resicor, SureStart 2, and Keystone NXT, to effectively control weeds, you can spend less time worrying about unwanted yield robbing plants and power on. Learn more at poweroverweeds.com power. Keystone NXT is a restricted use pesticide. Welcome back to Ag PhD Radio. Brian Hefty here along with my brother Darren. We're live in the Morton studio today on a Farmer Friday. If you'd like to call into the show, the number is 844-44-AG-PHD. Or you can email us radio at agphd.com. So I was just reading something, Darren, in Nebraska. They were talking about changing the drainage law. And here, here's one of the things that somebody was commenting on this. And let's see. It's... Uh, 
a UNL Extension Water Law and Ag Law Specialist. And listen to this. Water runs downhill, so the upper landowner is the one doing the drainage, and the lower landowner is the one ending up with the extra water they don't want. And this is one of the big... Uh, okay, so now back to my comments here. This is perhaps the biggest misconception about tiling. People think, I'm going to get more water because somebody's put tile in. And it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Just think about it logically for one second. And I realize as soon as I say that, you might get emotional and you go, I know I'm getting flooded out. Just stop. Take a deep breath. Think about it for one second. When a farmer's going to put tile in the ground, how does the farmer pay for the tile? What does the farmer pay for it with? Yield increase. And only with yield increase, right? Okay, we can all agree on that, correct? All right, now I want you to think about what takes more water out of the ground? 100 bushel corn or 300 bushel corn? Okay, well, obviously, 300 bushel corn is going to take three times the amount of water. So when you stop and think about it for just a second, I realize day one, sure, there might be a little more water at day one. But long term, I can promise you there's less water going downstream. There has to be if we're going to have yield increase. Now, granted, if there's no yield increase, the water volume is going to be the same going downstream. And if the yield was less, then of course, I agree with you, there would be more water going out to the downstream landowner. But anyway, it's until you see it, until you've done it, it seems a little hard to believe. But then when you step back and think about it logically, you go, oh, okay, I get it. And even on our own ground where We put in a bunch of tile back in 2007 to 2010. We did a lot of tiling. A bunch of those lines have barely run in the last five, eight years. Even when we had the super wet years of 2018 and 2019, record rainfall, guess what? Tile lines barely ran. You know why? Because we had 250 plus bushel corn in some of those areas that used to raise 100. So I'm just trying to say before we have lawyers talking about, oh, this is how things work. Lawyers aren't farmers, okay? If a lawyer wants to go put tile in and study it for 10 years and actually see on his ground and the neighbor's ground, then you come talk to me. But until then, I guess I get a little bit frustrated as a farmer when we have non-farmers who've never even seen tile telling us how it works. Well, they have seen tile, Brian. They just don't even realize it or acknowledge it that they have tile in their own house. And it's good for them, but it's not good for everybody else. I, that frustrates me. Well, it's a lot different with a house, though, Darren, and here's why. Because a house can't absorb water. My crop can, and that's the whole difference. So if they look at their house and they go, well, every time it rains, I get water in my sump pump. That's not true when we go out and take a look at a field. So that's the enormous difference, and that's where we sometimes get a big disconnect. So anyway, I'm not trying to make this political or anything else. I don't care. You do whatever you want to do. But I just get frustrated when people don't understand how tile actually works. All right. Well, speak about that root system taking things in. That's exactly what Jim wants to talk about from South Dakota here. Jim, how are you doing? Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? You bet. I'm a little fatter than I was before I started to come up to all your seminars with that good food, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. came up there quite a bit. I learned a lot. Um, Did your person tell you my first question, or should I repeat it? Go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Nope, nope. Let us know what your questions are. Um, One of the big things, I was up there, and I learned that uh, corn has a huge amount more vascular in the roots more to, to create more soil. I'm rebuilding some gravel pits and stuff and farming them that were mined and uh, I put corn in as much as I can. And I think you said, one of you said five to seven times more root uh, area. And I don't know well, if it's five or well, seven. Or well, five. roughly roughly on average, corn has about five times the root mass of soybeans. And okay. just as a general statement, when you look at any plant above ground, typically the amount of mass above ground is how much mass there is below ground. So when you think about a cornfield and just how huge those plants are, then you got to think about there's that much mass below ground too. Okay, that's what I had. And then the other question I had was, um, there's some sprays I've heard people talk about. I don't know what they are, like around your irrigators and maybe where you park your equipment. You don't want the weeds to come and, and the grass. You can spray it, you know, once or twice a year and it holds quite a while. Ground sterilant? Yep. Tell me. Yeah, yes. ground sterilant. Yeah, so... Yep, there are a number of different products out there like Hivar, 
Pramatol, and a number of others. Yep. Pramatol. Okay. Yep. High bar and Pramatol would be a couple I can think of off the top of my head. Now, one thing I'll caution you about with those, Jim, is if you spray them where soil is going to move, they will move with soil. So say, for yep. example, you had a hillside and you're going to spray them at the top of the hill and then you get a big four inch rain that's enough to move dirt. It's going to move with the dirt. Yep. That's so exactly you want to what... spray it in flat areas. And, yep. uh, you know, if you're in a spot that doesn't get a ton of rainfall, that's a, a big plus too. Yep. So like around our farm, we used to use some ground sterilants years ago and we have hills around our farm. Well, anyway, we'd spray right along the buildings so we didn't have to trim. So Darren, for Darren and my Myself, we used to spend literally when we were kids 40 hours a week mowing and trimming all the stuff on all our farms so we're like oh boy if we could spray and then we don't only have to trim you know every once in a while or more every once in a while that sounds great to us so we did this and pretty soon we started seeing streaks running down our hills uh and <laughs> we're like oh okay we're done with that and quite frankly, even spray, we used to spray Roundup underneath the fence lines. And every once in a while, I have to give some of our people a hard time because they go too far with their Roundup and they spray it in, in fence lines. And I'm like, it's fine if it's out by pasture or whatever. It's no real huge deal. But anywhere where you do that, if you don't continue to repeat that, whether we're talking the ground sterilant or Roundup, well, when you've killed everything, what do you think comes next? Weeds. weeds right. Okay. So then we started having all kinds of weeds in the fence lines, and I'm going, ah. Oh. So now we're right back to where we were before, mowing and trimming, and and that way it's just grass, and then we're in pretty good shape. So we'll spray 2,4-D or something like that, like Freelix, in the fence lines, but I don't really want to spray Roundup or uh, Pramatol or Hivar or anything like that, like a ground sterilant anymore. And I used to be a big believer in that. Now, after using it, and this is what we always say, hey, it's trial and error. We did it, hated it, never going back. Okay, so you, would you recommend then maybe doing some 2,4-D early before the trees and stuff and using the crops up to, to knock it off early? Well, you sure can, and it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, so exa- your situation is exactly. probably a lot different than If you've than got ours. pivots like a long ways from where you live or you just don't get there very often, then the ground sterile makes a lot of sense to me. Yep. Yeah, but just, again, keep in mind, if you kill, let's say there was grass there, and let's say you kill everything, well, eventually weeds are probably going to come back, and I don't know if you want that or not. So you just have to weigh that out and whatever you would like to have out there. Okay, and then... Could I have one little question? Um, Sandburrs? Yep. Uh, I know you, one of those you ran across something that um, is in the bottom of the page, takes out sandburrs. What well, crop? What crop? Uh, like grass. They get around where a house is. We're on a clay hill, and the sandburrs seem to come about August, and the dogs get them in their paws, and we get, you know, is there anything to do about that? Well, sandburrs an annual weed. So if you just keep hitting, you've got to, you've got to get it early. You can't you can't get it mid season in grass, but you can take it out early. I know even the guys that'll use Prowl, Brian, yep. uh, very early. Yep. That's been good. Pendimethalin, that's in some of the long uh, products, weed and feed kind of things but, that you'll see. Yep, mesotrione but, but also, also are, would have yeah, suppression. Yeah, on too. Yep, 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 and yeah. also the the mesotrione that, that Brian's mentioning. That's the active ingredient in Callisto. You see that in a lot of the lawn care products now. Mm-hmm. That would be another good one if you use it relatively early. You know, sandbur is a warm season annual grass, so you get a little bit more time, but you can wait till the lilacs bloom usually, and then spray. But that'll kill all of our other grass, like around our tree grove and stuff too. It will kill. It will kill the bad guys. Annual a lot of the, grasses. Yeah, a lot of the perennial. perennial lawn grasses. It they're going to be just fine. And like brome will be all right. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Correctly. Uh, correct. Yeah. It doesn't doesn't hit those perennials and. Uh, I've got another question coming up talking about perennials we'll get to in just a second. Hey, Jim, we got to run. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your support, too. We really appreciate it. It's Farmer Friday on Ag PhD Radio. We'll be right back. Heat, drought, wind, hail, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot. If your corn is under stress, you are, too. Get Veltima fungicide, swift activity, with fast payback, an expanded application window, makes life simple and it's a secure choice with powerful residual for visibly healthier corn swift simple secure veltima fungicide call your basf rep today always read and follow label directions veltima fungicide is not registered in all states farming is probably the most natural thing for a person to do 
It taught me how to take pride in my work, how to put something ahead of myself, whether it was getting up early to feed the livestock or working late to bring in the harvest. Farming taught me to give it my best, no matter the job. My name is Tanner. I'm a farmer. I work for Case IH. Case IH, built by farmers. Did you know soybean diseases like white mold and sudden death syndrome can survive in your soil even after rotating crops? Prevention of these diseases is a constant battle and yield loss from an infection can be devastating. The right management plan makes all the difference. Keep your beans safe this spring with Heads Up Seed Treatment. Heads Up guards your seed from both white mold and SDS. Stay protected and profitable by asking your seed dealer for Heads Up. Learn more at headsupst.com. Every week for more than two decades, Ag PhD TV has provided agronomic information to make your farm more productive and profitable. In each episode, we discuss a wide range of topics covering everything from crop fertility, promoting soil health, improving the environment, pest control, and more, all designed to help you push your farm to higher yield goals and more profitability. Be sure to catch us on Tuesdays and Saturdays on RFD TV. Check your local listings or visit agphd.com to learn more. Boost your productivity and profitability with Soil Warrior from Environmental Tillage Systems. Improve fertilizer efficiency and your yield potential in just one strip-till pass. Now that's ROI. Contact us today at SoilWarrior.com. Improve germination in your fields with the Germinator Closing Wheel from Farm Shop MFG. Our unique spike design seals your seed within a firm vein of soil, providing maximum seed-to-soil contact and maximum germination. Order a set for your planter at farmshopmfg.com. It's smart to make the right agronomic choices, and it's even smarter to get rewarded for them. With the Bayer Plus Rewards Program, you earn cash back on seed, herbicides, and other eligible products. And it keeps getting smarter, because now... You can earn an additional 10% bonus when you send your redemption check to your retailer. To learn more, contact your retailer today. Protect your yields and get the most from your land with Bayer Plus Rewards. Visit MyBayerPlus.com and see program terms and conditions for full details. Thanks for listening today to Ag PhD Radio. I'm Brian Hefty along with my brother Darren broadcasting today from the Morton studio on a Farmer Friday. If you'd like to call into the show, the number is 844-44-AG-PHD. That's 844-442-4743. Right before the break, we were talking just a little about sandbur and annual grasses that you can find in perennial grass. So a couple products that we did not mention that can be used post-emerge are Pastora, and plateau, depending on what type of grass you have. So anyway, there are definitely options to kill weeds like sandbur that are annual grasses in perennial grass crops, whether we're talking Bermuda grass, Barome grass, whatever your pasture or grass crop is. If it's a perennial, there are some options to kill those annual weeds. And then the other big thing is just do a good job with fertility, rotational grazing, keeping the grass tall. Let's say it's a lawn or whatever, if you keep the grass a little taller. Always remember, crop canopy is the best weed killer we have. It's better than any herbicide even. So if we can let the the grass itself, which in this case is the crop, do the work, then it's going to choke out a lot of weeds. All right, let's get back to the phone lines. Let's head over to uh, eastern Montana. Got Jerry on with us right now. Jerry, how's it going? It's going great. How are you guys doing? You know, we're doing well. We just need a little bit of moisture here, and we'll be ready to to, to get a crop this year. Kind of dry, but uh, how are things out there? You know, they're kind of dry, too, and that, that kind of reminds me of a story about years ago. We were in Australia with a farm group, and we had a gentleman on uh, uh, the tour named John from Illinois, and I said, John, what's your average rainfall in Illinois? And he said, well, sometimes well, you, normally it's 32 inches, uh, Sometimes we only get 30, but usually we get 32. And I said, holy cow, sometimes we get 20 and sometimes we get nothing. So we've got a lot more variability than you have out there. Well, I was talking to somebody uh, recently and they said, oh, man, we haven't had rain in two weeks. And I thought, wow, 
uh, we haven't had rain in two years. I, I don't know what's going yeah, on. Right. It seems like it. Now we have had a little bit, but not very much. And you're right. It's, it's different. And that leads to raising some different crops. And I was thinking about it for guys in your area. I bet there's a lot of opportunity as everybody fights over the corn and soybean acre. Think about things like chickpeas and lentils and field peas and other crops. There's got to be a good market for those things. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and, and there is going to be a lot of competition for acres. Uh, looking at today's markets, you would just about never know it after the big run-up yesterday. There's the big crash today in some of the major commodities, but that'll all level out. And uh, when it comes right down to it, it, with the prices there are, it's it's going to be uh, some opportunities, I think, for a lot of these other pulse crops that we raise. We talk to farmers all the time that, that hear our show and they say, man, you guys are always talking about protecting against a drought, protecting against a drought. Are you always on defense? And kind of to your point earlier, well, you just don't know if it's this is the year we get the rain or we don't. And so we got to put some practices in place that, that we can be OK, at least uh, if we don't get enough rain. What do you do in eastern Montana? Because I know conditions can get pretty tough out there. Uh, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, uh, on our farm, we just try and uh, try and uh, farm for average. And sometimes you wonder, well, what the heck is average? But um, you know, we just uh, try and do a good fertility from year to year, not get too carried away. Because here, I, I guess it was in '17, we went into the season with a full profile of moisture and. My son and I said, "Well, all we got to do is get a couple of decent rains and some reasonable temperatures, and we'll have a good crop." Well, we got one inch of rain during the growing season that year, and and then it got hot, and so um, that's the way it can go. And the last year and this year, both were we're going into the growing season with just about no reserves. So, so I guess a, a, a cautious approach, but. You still have to try and maintain uh, reasonable fertility. So if the opportunity arises with good moisture, you have to be in a position to take advantage of that. Absolutely. Very well said. Well, Jerry, good luck to you guys. I, I sure hope you guys catch some rain heading into the spring. I know that that uh, really, really helps uh, with optimism going into a year like this. So good luck to you, Jerry. You, all right. Thanks a lot. You guys take care. Good luck to you, too. You bet. Thanks. Yeah, we're going to need it this year, I think, to, to catch a little bit here. we got a ways to go to recharge. Uh, speaking of that, we got our friend Tony Wendler on. Haven't had you on for a little while, Tony. Well, you been busy down there? It, it, it's been a couple of things, Darren. Man, I got uh, this pneumonia-type stuff that for two, three weeks, you wouldn't have wanted to talk to me. I just sounded terrible. I might have been coughing right in the middle of it. Then And then also being busy. The... Uh, Swamp was busy, and then uh, that I know there was one time I passed on talking to you because I just couldn't have done it. So, are you ready? So, yeah. talk to me about your farm. Are you all set for spring, or you got a ways to go? Uh, the as far as uh, the farm, yeah, things are things are pretty much organized. I'm uh, getting some of the things. I've I've got a little bit of uh, fertilizer left to to line up. I didn't get it done on uh, part of it, and then. Uh, a big portion of it will be doing manure, so that's going to be really cost-effective. So uh, I just got to pay the pumping. So that's uh, that's that. We got seed covered. Uh, that's that's pretty well uh, organized. All right. um, as I know you work with a lot of farmers with the germinator closing wheels, and as you look at guys getting their planter set, I am amazed how many guys I talk to that say, oh, I'm still working on the planter and still need a few parts and that. Uh, how are you sitting on germinator closing wheels, and, and for guys that are still getting things put together, uh, do they have much lead time on that? How, how do you go about getting them? Uh, they can order. As far as lead time right now, the biggest thing for us is we're a couple of weeks behind on shipping. We've got very good inventory. The uh, we've got uh, about eight thousand in inventory right now, and I've got another truck due in in a couple of weeks again. So uh, we've got uh, really good inventories on product, and it's uh, just a matter from having been laid up here a while back. I got behind on things, and we're we're working through trying to catch up on shipping. Uh, the um, getting lots of conversation with farmers. In fact. Uh, just uh, just here a couple minutes ago, a couple of them uh, left, and we were talking about uh, they got a new John Deere planter and how we set it up and uh, things like that. So 
Uh, it's uh, we're getting lots of good feedback on the results farmers have gotten. Uh, a little bit, you know, the guy talking there with the uh, tell you a quick story. The guy with the dryness out uh, west, you were talking to. Yes. Uh, I had a guy in North Dakota call me up, and uh, he says, Tony, I had a problem in my field this last year. I had green strips, and uh, I didn't quite know what was going on. I said, okay. Uh, he said, yep. He said, I bought your wheels, and I put them beside my tracks because I couldn't close those furrows. And uh, every place I put your wheels, the corn emerged more even and faster. And he said, I could see it in all my fields. The... Uh, in that dryness, you know, we've talked a little bit, Darren, about that shoulder giving us that firm seed zone. Uh, it uh, helped him to wick moisture, and they started better than the other wheels. Anyway, he put in a nice order and finished out his 36 row. So uh, it's uh, that's one of the positives that we're seeing and, and talking with people on that. I've got uh, farmers who are talking to me that uh, – uh, their father-in-law had them last year, and they liked what they were doing, or their uh, their brother-in-law, or you know things like that, where uh, they've they've got uh, somebody in the family or uh, who's making a recommendation. You ought to get these, or a uh, neighbor. So the uh, the word's getting out that uh, this inner shoulder is really kind of a, a, a secret spice for closing that furrow. Well, it's been interesting, too, coming through some wet times and now coming through some dry times to see a piece of machinery that actually works through both. That's that's a nice trend in the industry. Hopefully that continues. Well, Tony, uh, thanks for being on. Glad you're starting to feel better. And for anybody listening saying, hey, I'm curious about these uh, inner shoulders and the pro germinator, or the, I'm sorry, the germinator closing wheels, you can check out all the details at farmshopmfg.com. Uh, Brian had another question come in on perennials, and a farmer said, I got perennials in soybeans, but Roundup is really expensive this year. Is there another alternative to take out things like Canada thistle and quack grass? No. Nope. Simply put, spend the money, you'll be happy. Yeah, and don't do tillage. Don't do tillage. Leave those root systems intact. And don't forget, I I mean, Roundup, yes, it's it's crazy expensive, but the soybean price this year is great. So it's only going to cost you a couple bushels, and then you have those perennials taken care of. It's Farmer Friday and Ag PhD Radio. We'll be right back after this. Protect your empire. Rule your fields with dual modes of action. Low Use Rate Authority Supreme Herbicide from FMC combines Group 14 and Group 15 modes of action for pre-plant and pre-emergence control of key broadleaf weeds and grasses. A preventative application keeps your fields clean when it matters most to crop productivity. Visit your FMC retailer or ag.fmc.com to learn more. Always read and follow all label directions. You can count on AgroLiquid for precision crop nutrition. When you don't get all your potash down in the fall, when weather or market prices change your management strategy, or when you want to balance your fertilizer program with micronutrients, AgroLiquid is ready with the products and application flexibility you want for in-season crop nutrition and the research-proven results you need. AgroLiquid. Apply less. Expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. This is a wake-up call for you and your field's microbiome from Source by Sound Agriculture. Source is a revolutionary foliar-applied biochemistry that doesn't rely on bulky nutrients or finicky biologicals to wake up your soil and unlock more nutrients per acre, all with a low use rate. It's like caffeine for microbes. Source works with the soil you've already got and the equipment you already use. So if you're a grower, go to sound.ag and learn more. And if you're a microbe, time to rise and shine. Your schedule can change by the minute, making it hard to stay on top of the latest agronomy information. But at Ag PhD, we have some good news for you. If you miss an episode of Ag PhD TV or radio, you can catch up at agphd.com. With years of valuable content and latest episodes available to stream for free, you can continue building your agronomic knowledge on any schedule. While you're there, don't forget to check for upcoming Ag PhD events and workshops. Watch, listen, and learn at agphd.com. Morton Buildings knows that great buildings need great people, and we want you to be the newest member of our team. Morton is expanding its construction crew, and we're seeking new and experienced candidates to fill our crew member positions. Morton provides great pay and training, 
So be a part of the next generation to build Morton. Don't let the opportunity to join the best construction crew in the business pass you by. Learn more on our careers page at mortonbuildings.com. What do you think of when you hear Palmer Amaranth or Water Hemp? If you use fierce herbicide in your soybean fields, you don't have to think about them at all. With two effective modes of action and up to eight weeks of residual control, Fierce takes on even the toughest weeds like water hemp and Palmer amaranth. Take control of your soybean fields and get incentives from Bayer Plus Rewards when you choose the power of Fierce herbicide. Talk to your local retailer today to put Fierce to work in your fields. Always read and follow label directions. You're listening to Ag PhD Radio on a Farmer Friday, broadcasting from the Morton studio today, taking your calls and questions at 844-44-AG-PHD. Let's head down to Oklahoma. Got Jeff on with us right now. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing fabulous. So, okay, I, I'm always jealous of guys further south of me that you can probably get going a bit earlier than us in the spring. What's happening out in the fields right now? Are you doing anything outside yet? So right now, last week, we got an inch of rain, uh, first measurable precipitation we've had in over 100 days. So we were in extreme drought, have been in extreme drought conditions, and I guess still are, and inch isn't going to solve that problem. But uh, we were able to get out right ahead of that, that rain and uh, get a top dress shot on our, on our winter wheat, and uh, that was... Uh, Great benefit to be able to get that in and have moisture put that into the soil. Uh, got our winter tillage done for, for spring crops, so uh, some deep ripping of some, some of our harder, uh, more compacted soils, getting, getting ready for our soybeans and milo. Excellent. You know, I just talked to another grower from Oklahoma who said he got out ahead of that rain with his top dress, and he goes, man, a lot of guys are still down in the dumps that we haven't had rain in so long, and they waited thinking, well, I don't know if it's going to amount to anything. I bet I bet they're regretting that now. Yes. I mean, that was a, that was a million-dollar rain. We had a lot of producers in my uh, vicinity that went out in November and December uh, on some rain chances that never materialized and, and put them at fertilizer application that, you know, was probably a waste. Um, and, you know, where we're sitting here at basically a dollar a pound nitrogen for top dress cost, uh, that's that's quite an expense to put out there on a wing and a prayer and then not get any moisture to incorporate it. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Now, you mentioned compact. Speak about incorporation. You mentioned compaction and uh, doing some tillage. Where did you see that compaction? Was it mainly wheel tracks? Do you have it deep? Is it just the top six or eight inches? Or, or when you said you're deep ripping, how deep did you have to go? So uh, we were running about 14 inches. So I've, I was in no-till for 24 years, and chemical costs have got to the point uh and, and availability issues that this past summer, uh, we actually bought a chisel and started working ground again. But we we farmed some gumbo farms, and that tight ground really needed opened up. And then, of course, headlands and driveways of, of all of our farms, you know, have, have compaction issues from that wheel traffic over the years. Gotcha. So how, how did no-till work in that gumbo ground over the years? You know, it actually worked real well. Um Gumbo can be so finicky on on getting a stand if yes. you don't have the proper moisture to get that crumbled up again. And when conditions are right, I've raised up to 126 bushel per acre wheat on one of my gumbo farms. Wow. So you know it can produce fabulous. Uh, for, for you know we're we're in a 32 bushel average <laughs> wheat cropping area for the state, and so you know I can really get some high yields on it. But conditions have to be perfect, and so you know two out of five years those conditions are just right. Yeah, that's, that that might even be generous, Jeff. Two out of five years conditions. Yes, exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious about that because I know uh, it sounds sometimes guys say, "Man, that gumbo ground did great," but oh, it can be really tough to work with some years too. So uh, it's good to hear. I'm glad glad things are going good. Yep. So nope, we're we're cruising right along and hoping for more spring moisture and. Uh, uh, you know, get our get our milo and soybeans out there, and have moisture for those to produce a bountiful crop. Absolutely. Well, good luck to you, Jeff. Uh, glad to hear you finally got some rain. Hopefully, it keeps coming. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Yep, you too. Hey, speaking about rain, Brian, we got one in. This is from Guy out in 
Hawaii. And he said, all right, guys, uh, I love your approach to soil science. We're, we're going to depart here a little bit from your usual uh, Midwestern row crop focus and talk about my macadamia nuts here on Hawaii Island. My CEC is a little over three. My pH is generally low. Five, it's in the fives because we're getting 160 inches of rainfall a year growing, growing crops on volcanic ash. Now, the university recommends that I put fertilizer on four times a year, but my question I'm wondering about, how do I keep things in the soil? I know I'm going to have leaching with this much rain. Uh, nothing seems to stay in the soil, and I think I'd be better off feeding the trees rather than trying to worry about the soil. So currently I track rainfall, and about every 30 inches or so, that's when I'm putting more things out there that are leachable like nitrogen or boron. Uh, I'm wondering, though, let's see. Can I accumulate stuff like zinc or phosphorus? Just wonder sure. if you had any kind of rule of thumb about how fast things leach out. Okay. So nitrate is going to leach out the fastest. Sulfate leaches at about half that speed. And boron leaches not as fast as sulfate. So those are the three big ones that we often talk about. But in your soil, with all that rain, potassium is going to leach to some degree too, just not nearly as fast as those. But to say, oh, we're only going to apply once every 30 inches of rain, or we're only going to apply every so many days or whatever, or four times a year, I think you're going to need to apply, I hate to say it, a lot more than that. So I, 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 if it's me, I'm going to look at doing some experiments, fertilizing every week, every couple of weeks, whatever, and I just be on a calendar and do it that way. As much as you can. And I realize a lot of days you're going to want to be out there. You can't necessarily be out there. But if there's any way I could pump some fertility to the trees or something like that, you just have to continue going all the time. Because if you aren't constantly feeding nutrition out there, it is going to leach away in those kind of soils with that much rainfall. So, yes, I can understand that that's a real challenge. But you got to figure out a way to overcome that thing. And I don't, I, my personal opinion is you're not putting on fertility often enough. You know, when we look at some of the CECs that are down in single, low single digits like that on the East Coast, they're they're literally putting stuff out there every what inch or two inches of rain. They're putting well, really low that, doses. Wait, so that's whoa, not, whoa, whoa! You can't make that pivots. as a general statement. Some people are doing that. Yes, all we're trying to say here is. At a three CEC, and with that amount of rainfall, you're not going to be able to hold nitrate, sulfate, or boron very well. And and potassium, too, is going to leach out fairly quickly for you compared to almost everybody else in the world. Phosphorus and zinc and copper, sure, you can hold those things fairly well, even in that type of soil. But even that, um, I'm still going to be way more concerned than almost anywhere else. You just have a, an unbelievably unique situation compared to a lot of what we deal with here in the Midwestern United States. So we get, for example, one-eighth your amount of rainfall, and our soil is 10 times as heavy. <laughs> so just running the simple math, um, it, it just means you have to run a completely different program than what we do, and I just still come back to four times a year is simply not enough. I... I I'm serious. I'd try to find out. A, I'd try to figure out a way that I can get some fertility out there almost every week. Otherwise, your plants are most likely going to be running short. And so, what's happening is they're getting a big load, then they're short. A big load, then they're short. A big load, then they're short. And I can't imagine that's super great. Yeah, yeah, that is really tough. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a whole lot of rain out there, no doubt about that. Good luck to you, guy. All right, Brian, got this one in from, from William in North Carolina, and he said, I've got a flower garden here that's showing some zinc toxicity. We pulled soil tests, and look at how high these micronutrient numbers are. They're astronomical. We've got a, a waste analysis product uh, that we've been putting out there, so I'm now doing tests on that oh. to see what's in that nobody had ever tested before. Oh, boy. So I'm wondering, if yep. you had numbers this high, would you take that soil out and just replace it since it's in flower beds, yes. or are there any remedies yes. for that? Not really when zinc is, and if I'm reading this right, 2,171, is that parts per million? It's a Malik 3 analysis. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's parts per million or pounds per acre. But either, either way, way. <laughs> it's 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 crazy. So 
yeah, if it's a tiny little area, would I take that soil out and replace it? You bet I would. And then what I would do is I'd spread that soil out on quite a few acres, and then that's going to be great fertilizer for those acres. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's for sure, no doubt about it. Well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for the question, and yeah, good luck to you, William. As you try to to get that situation remedied. It's Farmer Friday on Ag PhD Radio. We got a number of questions that have come into the radio mailbag. That's radio at agphd.com. But we still have our phone lines open. If you'd like to call in with a question or a comment of your own, it's 844 44 Ag PhD. What's new from New Farm? Longbow EC herbicide the latest in our portfolio of versatile weed management tools, gives you another carfentrazone option, taking aim at more than 60 broadleaf weed species. And did we mention economical? Longbow EC's low use rate makes it a flexible tank mix partner with most burned down non-selective herbicides. Ask your dealer for Longbow EC, available for fall. Go long for season long foliar disease protection that starts at plant. Only Zyway brand fungicides from FMC provide season-long inside-out foliar disease protection. A single at-plant application provides comparable performance in corn yield protection to that of VT to R1 foliar fungicides against diseases like gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, and more. Visit your FMC retailer or zyway.ag.fmc.com to learn more. Always read and follow all label directions. Beat resistant weeds with Tough IVC on your team. Add Tough IVC into your post emergent tank mix and even the playing field. Tough IVC, a selective contact herbicide, synergizes HPBD inhibitors and enhances the effect of PS2 herbicides. Tough IVC increases control of some of the toughest to kill herbicide resistant weeds, such as Palmer Amaranth and Waterhemp. Ask your local retailer about Tough IVC or visit BelchamUSA.com. Always read and follow label instructions. It's smart to make the right agronomic choices, and it's even smarter to get rewarded for them. With the Bayer Plus Rewards Program, you earn cash back on seed, herbicides, and other eligible products. And it keeps getting smarter, because now you can earn an additional 10% bonus when you send your redemption check to your retailer. To learn more, contact your retailer today. Protect your yields and get the most from your land with Bayer Plus Rewards. Visit MyBayerPlus.com and see program terms and conditions for full details. Soybean growers are dealing a swift blow to tough broad leaves and grasses with the two-in-one power of Moccasin MTZ. Moccasin MTZ combines the power of s metolachlor and a higher load of Metribuzin for outstanding weed control right from the outset with extended residual control to keep tough weeds down, including pigweed, water hemp, ragweed, and mare's tail. In addition to annual grasses like foxtail and barnyard grass, ask your retailer about Moccasin MTZ and always read and follow label directions. We now bring you an important news bulletin. This just in from Live Action News. Innovation has come to the world of burndown. New Elevore herbicide controls your toughest weeds, even glyphosate and ALS-resistant weeds like mare's tail and henbit. Talk with your retailer about Elevore herbicide today and ask how you can start elevating your burndown. Farmer Friday and Ag PhD Radio, and our phone lines are open at 844-44-AG-PHD. Let's get right back to him. we got Dennis with us down in southeast Nebraska. Dennis, good to talk to you today. Hi, how's everything up there? Dry, too? We are good and dry, no doubt about that. But Nebraska had great crops last year. How'd you turn out? We uh, probably had some of the best corn we ever raised, but then uh, our bean crop got a little short. It's didn't rain at the end and that and going there but uh one thing we had last year going into it is our full file was plumb full and we had some nice rains that soaked in hardly any of our rains in the summertime run off now this year is a whole different story we we're just i've never seen it as dry as it is right now and i'm 74 years old so it's it's darn dry in that and i'm the biggest thing i'm worried about is we just this profile isn't full and what kind of crop we will raise this year. It's going to have to have some timely rains 
to uh, get any kind of crop, a decent crop at all. No doubt about that. Or or we get some really good rains between now and planting time, but boy, we're running out of time. <clears throat> we're running out of time, yeah. I uh, believe, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, do a good hybrid selection, pick those hybrids that are, that are, uh, can take the drought. We had one number that the year before did tremendous. Last year, it cost about 25 bushels an acre. So it's just those factors in there that can do a lot of different things to your operation in that too. You know, as we look at, at this uh, spring, and certainly we've had some wild markets here too, is that going to force you to adjust some acres to a different crop, or are you going to kind of stick with what you're doing? We're pretty well staying with what we're doing. We've got, uh, we're going to go just a little more corn, because if we, and that'll depend when we start planting. I mean, if if it's, uh, if the moisture doesn't look like it's coming, we might switch to more beans yet. You know, depends. We don't have any of our nitrogen on. You know, we use liquid and gravel on just before we plant in that. So uh, that's not going to be a factor. But uh, luckily, we got all our input costs bought. And, good, uh, good. That 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 that, uh, that helps a lot. I mean, right now, if you start fessing on what it's going to cost you, you ain't got your inputs. What you know, it's going to be tough. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And even getting things in place in time is is a challenge. Hey, one one quick question for you, Dennis, before we let you go. This gall midge larvae that the guys in, especially northeast Nebraska, are seeing. Are you getting that down in your part of the state? We didn't notice anything last year, and but. As dry as it is now, and the winter's been mild, you know, it could possibly show up. I don't know. I I didn't notice anything last year, and I I got a fertilizer business, and I get around a lot of different people and didn't notice it anywhere in southeast Nebraska. But there could have been some that I didn't know about either. Yeah, a lot of growers uh, around the country starting to hear about how big a challenge this has been for growers out uh, out in uh, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, mm-hmm. and starting to get a little worried. They're they're always nervous about that next pest coming through. What do you think is the reason you got it up there? We don't have it down here, or just the weather, or or moisture, or dry weather, or what brings it on? Well, that's a great question. I think the winter survival of the of the bug is a big deal and like you say we've we've had kind of an open winter so mm-hmm. we'll see you know i know it hasn't been super cold either i don't know if it's been cold enough to kill off a lot of bugs but i guess we'll find out hopefully there'll be a natural predator that'll love to eat these little guys and we won't have to worry about them right right but uh, no it's it's going to be an interesting year i just uh uh the prices too you don't care to you know we got some fantastic prices until today but i mean you just don't want to do a lot of pricing until you know what you got, you know, and as dry as it is right now, it's a whole different story. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, Dennis, uh, good talking to you here. Good luck as you head towards spring. I know we're hoping to recharge the soil with some moisture too. Hopefully you guys catch some as well. Yeah. Well, I got a good fall day wrote down for October. I mean, for April 1st. So I'm hoping we get some good rains and it breaks the drought. That would be amazing. And then we can plant some corn a couple, two, three weeks after that. It'll be just perfect. Right, 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 right. Well, good visiting with you guys. You bet. Thanks, Dennis. Really appreciate it. Uh, Brian had a couple of questions come in. This is from Wyatt up in North Dakota. And he said, in northern North Dakota, just wondering about your mineralization of organic matter. A lot of times you guys talk about 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen for each percentage of organic matter throughout the whole summer. Uh, what do you think guys in northern North Dakota could get on an average year? Um, I'd probably say in that 15 to 20 pounds per percent of organic matter. But let's keep in mind, one of the big things that can hinder that is is it not just your cold, but drainage. If you have poor drainage it's to the point where the water table is really high all season long, now you got a real problem because you're killing off some of those microbes that could break down that organic matter in the soil. So that's part of the reason why when you look at some of the organic matter levels that end up in really high uh, in really poor drainage areas, they actually look pretty good in the short term because nothing is broken down super well and you don't get that mineralization. So just make sure you have good drainage and then I certainly would expect that 15 to 20 pounds of nitrogen for every 1% of organic matter, but it's going to vary and it's going to probably vary a lot, just like it does for us on our farm. Some years it might be 20 
or less. Uh, other years, it might be 30 or more. So we're just kind of giving you a general guideline. It's important to understand that, though, because if you do have some high organic matter soils, you don't need to apply the amount of nitrogen that you would if you had a low organic matter soil. All right. Now, his other question here, he said, if I'm seeding wheat on a field that has 200 pounds of N on it in the top 24 inches with 35 pounds of that in the top six, how much credit would he give for the nitrogen down in the six to 24 inch range in northern North Dakota heavy ground? All of it. So what I would do is just like how we would manage corn, I would manage wheat the exact same way. Where it comes to the time where like for corn, I want a side dress or like for you and wheat, you'd want a stream bar. I would go out and I'd pull some pre-side dress nitrate tests. That's what we call them for corn. But you're just pulling nitrate tests that cost $5. So I, I think that's the right thing to do because now you actually have data. And then you can see, hey, did we lose that stuff that was in that 6 to 24 inch range or is it still there? All right. I got this one from Don. Um, guys, we're going to start an orchard garden with about 50 trees on it in just the next couple of weeks here. And I wanted to ask you, as you're building up soil ahead of trees, what would you do for fertility? And then also, if Load I need up. iron, can I add iron sulfate at the same time as I'm planting those trees? Well, everything I would try to do in advance. And I'm talking well in advance, because if you start putting ridiculous amounts of fertilizer on, that also means you're going to have ridiculous amounts of salt. And that's not great for any small plant, whether it's a crop or a tree. So I would say I want to load up on things that don't move very well in soil. For example, on our, on our farm, when we put in a new shelter belt about five years ago, we built our soil K level from in that area. It was poor because it hadn't been it had well I guess no I'll take that back it had been crop but it, it still wasn't great I'm going to say it was probably three percent base saturation K we built it all the way up to seven percent so literally we put on a thousand pounds of potash we put on a whole bunch of phosphorus we put on uh, a few other nutrients as well but when you stop and think about nutrients like phosphorus zinc and copper especially and potassium in our heavy soils without much rain they just don't move. It's going to take years and years to get them down in the soil. And I mean, literally decades, and they aren't even going to move an inch or two. So I'd rather place them down deep where I need them. And then you can really get that tree grove off to a great start. So that's what I would suggest. Get the, get the things that are immobile down there deep and really build that up. Things like nitrogen, sulfur, boron, if you ever need those, it's real easy to apply those on the soil surface. Rain will take them down in, and your crop, or in this case, trees, will get them very quickly. All right. Uh, question here from BMW who says, I'm in the Delmarva region. We don't usually plant our beans early because we get slugs if we do, so we can plant them a little bit later. Our problem weeds have been ragweed and mare's tail, but recently water hemp has really come on strong. My questions, you say we can't use Valor and Sulfentrazone or, or Authority at the same time. Right. I'm wondering, could I run my uh, Valor early and yes. then come back a month later or so and put on my Authority? Well, a month, you're, you're kind of pushing it. Can you do it? Yes. You just have to be really careful with the rates. If you get too much of, of both in combination you you will hurt the crop so you got to be really careful yeah we just worry about i mean it's one thing to kill to not kill a few weeds it's another thing to hurt the crop and that's that's really tough to come back from so we like to be conservative on those types of things but you're right spacing them out of ways can be a good thing well thanks for listening to today's program be sure to join us again each weekday for more ag phd radio